Four millennia ago, the ancient Babylonians recorded a tale of how the solar system was created. The name of the tale is the Enuma Elish, and its true origin is much older than 4,000 years ago. The earliest version of the text found so far is from Ashurbanipal's library at Nineveh, dated to circa 1200 BC, but their colonophons indicate that these are all copies of a much older version of the myth dating from long before the fall of Sumer in circa 1750 BC. This is about as far as mainstream academia will take you. But in order to appreciate the historical written account that is older than the Bible by a thousand years or more, you must bother to actually study the text. The puzzles of our solar system the oceanic cavities upon Earth, the devastation upon the moon, the reverse orbits of the comets, the enigmatic phenomena of Pluto, all are perfectly answered by the Enuma Elish creation epic. The epic of creation clearly states that Marduk was an invader from outside the solar system, passing by the outer planets including Saturn and Jupiter before colliding with Tiamat. The Sumerians called the planet Nibiru, the planet of crossing, and the Babylonian version of the epic retained the following astronomical information. Planet Nibiru, the crossroads of heaven and earth he shall occupy. Above and below, they shall not go across. They must await him. Planet Nibiru, planet which is brilliant in the heavens, he holds the central position, to him they shall pay homage. Planet Nibiru. It is he who without tiring the midst of Tiamat keeps crossing. Let crossing be his name, the one who occupies the midst. According to scholar R. Campbell Thompson, who wrote reports of the magicians and astronomers of Nineveh and Babylon, several ancient texts trace the progress of the planet as it ringed the station of Jupiter and arrived at the point of crossing. Nibiru. Quote, when from the station of Jupiter the planet passes towards the west, there will be a time of dwelling in security. Kindly peace will descend on the land. When from the station of Jupiter the planet increases in brilliance and in the zodiac of Cancer will become Nibiru. Akade will overflow with plenty. The king of Akade will grow powerful. When Nibiru culminates, the lands will dwell securely. Hostile kings will be at peace. The gods will receive prayers and hear supplications. The nearing planet, however, was expected to cause rains and flooding, as its strong gravitational effects had been known to do. When the planet of the throne of heaven will grow brighter, there will be floods and rains. When Nibiru attains its perigee, the gods will give peace. Troubles will be cleared up. Complications will be unraveled. Rains and floods will come. End quote. The Sumerians believed that the gods were of the heavens. The ancient texts that reference a pre creation time period describe such heavenly gods as Apsu, Tiamat, Anshar, and Kishar. None of the texts discovered thus far claim that the gods of this category ever appeared upon earth. These so-called gods were actually celestial bodies that make up our solar system, and the Sumerian accounts regarding these celestial beings are in fact precise and scientifically plausible cosmologic concepts regarding the creation of our solar system. To keep track of the movements of the celestial bodies and their positions in the heavens relative to earth and to one another, the Babylonians and Assyrians kept accurate ephemerides. These were tables that listed and predicted the future positions of the celestial bodies. Professor George Sarton, author of Chaldean Astronomy of the Last Three Centuries B.C., found that they were computed by two methods a later one used in Babylon, and an older one from Uruk. His unexpected finding was that the older, Uruk method was more sophisticated and more accurate than the later system. He accounted for this surprising situation by concluding 
that the erroneous astronomical notions of the Greeks and Romans resulted from a shift to a philosophy that explained the world in geometric terms, while the astronomer priest of Chaldea followed the prescribed formulas and traditions of Sumer. The Babylonians and Assyrians devoted a substantial part of their astronomical efforts to keeping an accurate calendar. Like the Jewish calendar to this very day, it was a solar lunar calendar, correlating the solar year of just over 365 days with a lunar month of just under 30 days. While a calendar was important for business and other mundane needs, its accuracy was required primarily to determine the precise day and moment of the new year, and other festivals and worship of the gods. To measure and correlate the intricate movements of the sun, earth, moon, and planets, the Mesopotamian astronomer priests relied on a complex spherical astronomy. Earth was taken to be a sphere with an equator and poles. The heavens, too, were divided by imaginary equatorial and polar lines. The passage of celestial bodies was related to the ecliptic, the projection of the plane of Earth's orbit around the sun upon the celestial sphere. The equinoxes, the points, and the times at which the sun in its apparent annual movement north and south crosses the celestial equator, and the solstices, the time when the sun during its apparent annual movement along the ecliptic is at its greatest declination north or south. All these are astronomical concepts to this very day. But the Babylonians and Assyrians did not invent the calendar or the ingenious methods for its calculation. Their calendars, as well as our own, originated in Sumer. There, the scholars have found a calendar, in use from the very earliest times, that is the basis for all later calendars. The principal model was the calendar of Nippur, the seat and center of Enlil, and it is the model on which our present-day calendar is based. Even now, in the 21st century, many scholars and academics refuse to acknowledge the potential existence of planet Nibiru, much less its possible origin. Ironically, it is the modern-day language experts who have authenticated and verified the use of the term Nibiru in ancient astronomical texts of the Babylonians, Assyrians, and Sumerians. For those of you who like technical details, a reference section has been included at the end of this presentation that provides citations of the actual text discovered and translated thus far. But getting back to the question of Nibiru's origin, the archive has a very simple answer, albeit with a rather intricate explanation. Logically speaking, we can begin this deduction with a straightforward and uncomplicated choice. Either Nibiru is from our own solar system or from somewhere else. And since one of the oldest written astronomical accounts in our history indicates that it was an invader from outside our solar system, the archive confidently posits that Nibiru was not an original inhabitant of the Sol system. In September of 2021, the archive released a presentation on the topic of Planet 9 and the most up-to-date research regarding its possible location. In that video, we concluded that while it was possible for Planet 9 and Nibiru to be one and the same, it is more likely that it is not. Based on the postulated size, orbital path, and timeline, Planet 9 does not match up well with the descriptions of Nibiru. Nevertheless, modern astronomy has acknowledged the potential existence of a very large planetary mass that may have arrived in our solar system after its creation. A rogue planet is an interstellar object of planetary mass which is smaller than a star and a brown dwarf and without a host planetary system. Such objects have been ejected from the planetary system in which they formed or have never been gravitationally bound to any star or brown dwarf. The Milky Way alone may have billions to trillions of rogue planets. The planet-building process can be chaotic, 
since smaller objects collide with one another and sometimes stick together to form larger bodies. But occasionally, collisions and close encounters can be so violent that they fling a planet out of the gravitational grip of its parent star. Rogue planets may also form in isolation from clouds of gas and dust similar to how stars grow. A small cloud of gas and dust could collapse to form a central planet instead of a star, with moons instead of planets surrounding it. These objects are known as sub-brown dwarfs, and we believe this could be the origin and classification of Nibiru. It would certainly explain the number of natural satellites around the planet as attested in the ancient Mesopotamian text. Now, one of the perpetual refrains regurgitated by armchair astronomers and YouTube experts is that such a planet could not possibly sustain life. Of course, these individuals are ignorant of the actual science related to the topic. While it can be true that interstellar planets generate little heat and are not heated by a star, some planet-sized objects adrift in interstellar space might sustain a thick atmosphere that would not freeze out. These atmospheres would be preserved by the pressure-induced far-infrared radiation opacity of a thick hydrogen-containing atmosphere. During planetary system formation, several small protoplanetary bodies may be ejected from the system. An ejected body would receive less of the stellar-generated ultraviolet light that can strip away the lighter elements of its atmosphere. Even an Earth-sized body would have enough gravity to prevent the escape of the hydrogen and helium in its atmosphere. In an Earth-sized object, the geothermal energy from residual core radioisotope decay could maintain a surface temperature above the melting point of water, allowing liquid water oceans to exist. These planets are likely to remain geologically active for long periods. If they have geodynamo-created protective magnetospheres and seafloor volcanism, hydrothermal vents could provide energy for life. And of particular importance is the fact that the addition of large satellites would be a source of significant geological tidal heating. So, technically, the possibility of life on a rogue planet can be easily theorized. But what about complex life like the human species found here on Earth? Well, scientifically speaking, the truth is, we still do not know. But... Historically speaking, we have some of the oldest written texts on our planet that describe intelligent life visiting Earth from an intruder planet outside of our solar system. At the very least, it is worth acknowledging the impressive fact that over 5,000 years ago, the Sumerians were writing about an astrophysical event that our modern-day academic community is just now beginning to to discover. According to Sumerian astronomy, Nibiru is a term of the highest point of the ecliptic, for example the point of summer solstice and its associated constellation. As the highest point in the paths of the planets, Nibiru is considered the seat of the Sumus Deus, who pastures the stars like sheep in Babylon identified with Marduk. The establishment of the Nibiru point is described in Tablet 5 of the creation epic Enuma Elish. Quote, when Marduk fixed the locations of Nibiru, Enlil, and Ea in the sky. End quote. Nibiru is mentioned at different astronomical locations in conjunction with the positions of stars and planets, mostly as the star of Marduk. However, the various stars or planets were not subject to any fixed interpretation. For example, the star of Ea was described at various revelation spots, including Vela, Fomalhaut, and Venus. Similar interpretations were made for the other stars of the gods, so multiple celestial coordinates must be considered. Nibiru is described more closely on a complete cuneiform tablet. Nibiru, which is said to have occupied the passageways of heaven and earth, 
because everyone above and below ask Nibiru if they cannot find the passage. Nibiru is Marduk's star, which the gods in heaven calls to be visible. Nibiru stands as a post at the turning point. The others say of Nibiru the post, The one who crosses the middle of the sea without calm, may his name be Nibiru, for he takes up the center of it. The path of the stars of the sky should be kept unchanged. Franz Boll, a Dutch professor of Hebrew and Assyriology, called the previous text objectively the most difficult passage, although it has been handed down in its entirety. The Nibiru tablet does not provide any essential help for the clarification. In the Akkadian language, Nibiru is translated to crossing or point of transition, especially of rivers. Nibiru has been associated with the area of Libra, the Nibiru constellation rose in the month of Tisridum around the autumn equinox. However, Nibiru was also a name for the planet Jupiter when observed in the month of Tisridum. Entry 1 is Enuma Elish, Tablet 5, Line 6. Quote, he set fast the position of Nibiru to fix their bounds. Entry number 2, Enuma Elish, Tablet 7. Line 124. Let Nibiru be the holder of the crossing place of the heaven and of the earth. Entry 3. Enuma Elish. Tablet 7. Line 126. 130 through 131. Nibiru is his star, which he made appear in the heavens. The stars of heaven, let him set their course. Let him shepherd all the gods like sheep. Entry 4, Astrolabe B, the star catalog, known as KAV-218B, lines 29 through 32. The red star which stands in the south after the gods of the night have been finished dividing the sky in half. This star is Nibiru. Entry 5, Mullapin 1, 3638. When the stars of Enlil have been finished, one big star, although its light is dim, divides the sky in half and stands there. That is the star of Marduk, Nibiru, Jupiter. It keeps changing its position and crosses the sky. The next eight entries are from various star lists. Entries 6 and 7 are from cuneiform tablets 26.41, V1, and 44.12, where the star named Nibiru is mentioned. Entries 8 and 9 are from cuneiform tablets 25.35.7 and 36.6, where the god Nibiru, the merciful Marduk, is mentioned. Entries 10 through 13 are from the Chicago Assyrian Dictionary, page 147, and the Omen text, where the star Nibiru and the god Nibiru are mentioned. Entries 14 and 15 are from tablets K.6174 verse 9 and K.12769 verse 6. Both have the phrase, quote, If Mercury divides the sky and stands there, its name is Nibiru. End quote. This information represents the generally accepted academic consensus related to the term Nibiru. There are two unequivocal facts with which the academics agree. Number one, the term Nibiru is real and appears multiple times in the Enuma Elish, Astrolabe B, Molopin, and Cuneiform Babylonian tablets rendering various star lists. Number two, among other meanings, the academics agree that in several circumstances the term Nibiru is representative of a star, planet, or god. When on high the heaven had not been named, firm ground below had not been called by name, when primordial Apsu, their begetter, and Mamu, Tiamat, she who bore them all, their waters mingled as a single body, 
No reed hut had sprung forth, no marshland had appeared. None of the gods had been brought into being, and none bore a name, and no destinies determined. Then it was that the gods were formed in the midst of heaven. Lamu and Lahamu were brought forth by name, they were called. Before they had grown in age and stature, Anshar and Kishar were formed, surpassing the others. Long were the days, then there came forth. Anu was their heir, of his father's the rival. Yes, Anshar's first son, Anu, was his equal. Anu begot, in his image, Nudimud. This Nudimud was of his father's the master, of broad wisdom, understanding, mighty in strength, mightier by far than his grandfather Anshar. He had no rival among the gods, his brothers. Thus were established and were the great gods. They disturbed Tiamat as they surged back and forth. Yes, they troubled the mood of Tiamat. By their hilarity in the abode of heaven, Apsu could not lessen their clamor, and Tiamat was speechless at their ways. Their doings were loathsome unto. Their way was evil. They were overbearing. Then Apsu, the begetter of the great gods, cried out addressing Mamu, his minister. O oh, Mamu, my vizier, who rejoices my spirit, come here and let us go to Tiamat. They went and sat down before Tiamat, exchanging counsel about the gods the firstborn. Apsu, opening his mouth, said to resplendent Tiamat, Their ways are truly loathsome to me. By day I find no relief, nor repose by night. I will destroy, I will wreck their ways. That quiet may be restored. Let us have rest. As soon as Tiamat heard this, she was furious and called out to her husband. She cried out aggrieved as she raged all alone. She uttered a curse, and unto Apsu she spoke. What? Should we destroy that which we have built? Their ways indeed are most troublesome, but let us attend kindly. Then Mamu answered, giving counsel to Absu. Ill-wishing and ungracious was Mamu's advice. Do destroy, my father, the mutinous ways. Then you will have relief by day and rest by night. When Absu heard this, his face grew radiant because of the evil he planned against the gods, his sons. As for Mamu, he embraced him by the neck, as that one sat on his knees to kiss him. Now whatever they had plotted between them was repeated unto the gods, their firstborn. When the gods heard this, they were astir, then lapsed into silence and remained speechless. Surpassing in wisdom, accomplished, resourceful, Ea, the all-wise, saw through their scheme. A master design against it he devised and set up made artful his spell against it, surpassing and holy. He recited it and made it subsist in the deep. As he poured sleep upon him, sound asleep he lay. When he had made Absu prone, drenched with sleep, Mamu, the advisor, was powerless to stir. He loosened his band, tore off his tiara, removed his halo and put it on himself. Having fettered Absu, he slew him. Mamu, he bound and left behind Locke. Having thus established his dwelling upon Apsu, he laid hold of Mamu, holding him by the nose rope. After Ea had vanquished and trodden down his foes, had secured his triumph over his enemies, in his sacred chamber in profound peace had rested. He named it Apsu, for shrines he assigned it. In that same place his cult hut he founded. Ea and Damkina, his wife, dwelled there in splendor. In the chamber of fates, the abode of destinies, a god was engendered, most able and wisest of the gods. In the heart of Absu was Marduk created. In the heart of holy Absu was Marduk created. He who begot him was Ea, his father. She who bore him was Damkina, his mother. The breast of goddesses he did suck. The nurse that nursed him filled him with awesomeness. Alluring was his figure, sparkling the lift of his eyes. Lordly was his gait, commanding from of old. When Ea saw him, the father who begot him, he exalted and glowed, his heart filled with gladness. He rendered him perfect and endowed him with a double godhead. Greatly exalted was he above them, exceeding throughout. Perfect were his members beyond comprehension, unsuited for understanding, difficult to perceive. Four were his eyes, four were his ears, when he moved his lips, fire blazed forth. Large were all four hearing organs. 
and the eyes in like number scanned all things. He was the loftiest of the gods, surpassing was his stature. His members were enormous, he was exceedingly tall. My little son, my little son, my son the sun, son of the heavens, clothed with the halo of ten gods, he was strong to the utmost. As their awesome flashes were heaped upon him, Anu brought forth and begot the fourfold wind, consigning to its power the leader of the host. He fashioned, stationed the whirlwind. He produced dreams to disturb Tiamat. The gods, given no rest, suffer in the storm, their hearts having plotted evil. To Tiamat, their mother said, When they slew Absu, your consort, you did not aid him but remained still. When he created the dread fourfold wind, your vitals were diluted and so we can have no rest. Let Absu, your consort, be in your mind. And Mamu, who has been vanquished, you are left alone. You pace about distraught, without cease. You do not love us. Our eyes are pinched. Without cease, let us have rest. To battle, avenge them, and render them as the wind. When Tiamat heard these words, she was pleased. You have given, let us make monsters and the gods in the midst. Let us do battle and against the gods. They banded themselves together and marched at the side of Tiamat. Enraged, they plot without cease night and day. They are set for combat, growling, raging. They form a council to prepare for the fight. Mother Huber, she who fashions all things, added matchless weapons, bore monster serpents, sharp of tooth, unsparing of fang. With venom for blood, she has filled their bodies. Roaring dragons, she has clothed with terror, has crowned them with halos, making them like gods. Whoever beheld them, terror overcame him and that, with their bodies reared up, none might turn them back. She set up the viper, the dragon, and the monster Lahamu, the great lion, the mad dog, and the scorpion man, mighty lion demons, the dragonfly, the centaur, bearing weapons that do not spare, fearless in battle. Her decrees were firm, they were beyond resisting. Altogether eleven of this kind she brought forth. From among the gods, her firstborn, who formed her assembly, she elevated King Yu, made him chief among them, the leading of the ranks, command of the assembly, the raising of weapons for the encounter, advancing to combat, to direct the battle, to control the fight. These she entrusted to his hand as she seated him in the council. I have cast for you the spell exalting you in the assembly of the gods. To counsel all the gods, I have given you full power. Truly, you are supreme. You are my only consort. Your utterance shall prevail over all the Anunnaki. She gave him the tablet of destinies fastened on his breast. As for you, your command shall be unchangeable. Your word shall endure. As soon as King Yu was elevated, possessed of the rank of Anu, they decreed the fate for the gods, his sons. Your word shall make the first subside, shall humble the power weapon, so potent in its sweep. When Tiamat had thus lent import to her handiwork, she prepared for battle against the gods her offspring. To avenge Apsu, Tiamat planned evil. That she was girding for battle was divulged to Ea. As soon as Ea heard of this matter, he lapsed into dark silence and sat still. The days went by and his anger subsided. He went to Anshar, his forefather. When he came before his grandfather, Anshar, he repeated all that Tiamat had plotted to him. My father Tiamat, she who bore us, detests us. She has set up the assembly and is furious with rage. All the gods have rallied to her. Even those whom you brought forth march at her side. They throng and march at the side of Tiamat. Enraged, they plot without cease night and day. They are set for combat, growling, raging. They have formed a council to prepare for the fight. Mother Huber, she who fashions all things, has added matchless weapons, has borne monster serpents. Sharp of tooth, unsparing of fang, with venom for blood she has filled their bodies. Roaring dragons she has clothed with terror has crowned them with halos, making them like gods, so that he who beholds them is overcome by terror. Their bodies rear up and none can withstand their attack. 
She has set up the viper, the dragon, and the sphinx, the great lion, the mad dog, and the scorpion man, mighty lion demons, the dragonfly, the centaur, bearing weapons that spare not, fearless in battle. Her decrees are firm, they are beyond resisting, altogether eleven of this kind she brought forth. From among the gods, her firstborn, who formed her assembly, she has elevated King Yu, has made him chief among them. The leading of the ranks, command of the assembly, the raising of weapons for the encounter, advancing to combat, to direct the battle, to control the fight. She entrusted these to his hands as she seated him in the council. I have cast the spell for you, exalting you in the assembly of the gods, to counsel all the gods I have given you full power. Truly you are supreme, you are my only consort. Your utterance shall prevail over all the Anunnaki. She has given him the tablet of destinies, fastened on his breast. As for you, your command shall be unchangeable, your word shall endure. As soon as King Yu was elevated, possessed of the rank of Anu, they decreed the fate for the gods her sons. Your word shall make the fire subside, shall humble the power weapon, so potent in its sweep. When Anshar heard that Tiamat was sorely troubled, he struck his loins and bit his lips. The following lines are corrupted because the tablet is damaged here. There are various proposals for how to reconstruct them. His heart was gloomy, his mood restless, he covered his mouth to stifle his outcry. Battle, you. Lo, you killed Mamu and Apsu. Now, kill King Yu, who marches before her. Wisdom. Nudie mood, the of the gods. A break in the tablet loses about 12 lines here. He addressed a word to Anu, his son, mighty hero, whose strength is outstanding, his onslaught cannot be withstood. Go and stand before Tiamat, that her mood be calmed, that her heart may be merciful. If she will not listen to your word, then tell her our word, that she might be calmed. When he heard the command of his father Anshar, he made straight for her away, following the road to her. But when Anu was near enough to see the plan of Tiamat, he was not able to face her, and he turned back. He came objectively to his father Anshar. He addressed him. The following 20 lines are badly damaged. There are various reconstructions of this section. My hand suffices not for me to subdue you. Anshar was speechless as he stared at the ground. Hair on edge, shaking his head at Ea, all the Anunnaki gathered at that place. Their lips closed tight. They sat in silence. No god, they thought, can go to battle and, facing Tiamat, escape with his life. Anshar, he said to an avenger, the hero, in his place of seclusion, he spoke to him, your father. For you are my son who comforts his heart when facing Anshar approach as though in combat. Stand up as you speak, seeing you, he will grow restful. The Lord rejoiced at the word of his father. He approached and stood before Anshar. When Anshar saw him, his heart filled with joy. He kissed his lips and his fear departed from him. Anshar, be not muted, open wide thy lips. I will go and attain thy heart's desire. Anshar, be not muted, open wide your lips. I will go and attain your heart's desire. What male is it who has pressed his fight against you? Tiamat, a woman that flies at you with weapons. Be glad and rejoice. You shall soon tread upon the neck of Tiamat. Be glad and rejoice. You shall soon tread upon the neck of Tiamat. My son, you who knows all wisdom, calm Tiamat with your holy spell. On the storm chariot, proceed with all speed. For your blood shall not be spilled, you will return again. The Lord rejoiced at the word of his father. His heart exulting, he said to his father, Creator of the gods, destiny of the great gods, if I indeed, as your avenger, conquer Tiamat and give you life, set up the assembly, proclaim my destiny to be supreme. When jointly in Ubsukina you have set down rejoicing, let my word instead of you determine the fates. What I may bring into being shall be unalterable. The command of my lips shall be neither recalled nor changed.
Anshar opened his mouth and addressed a word to Gaga, his minister. O Gaga, my vizier, who gladdens my spirit, I will dispatch you to Lamu and Lahamu. You are adept, produce you before me. Let all the gods, let them hold, converse, sit down to a banquet, let them eat bread, let them mix wine. For Marduk, their avenger, let them fix the decrees. Be on your way, Gaga, take the stand before them, and that which I shall tell you repeat to them. Anshar, your son, has sent me here, charging me to give voice to the dictates of his heart. He says that Tiamat, she who bore us, detests us. She has set up the assembly and is furious with rage. All the gods have rallied to her. Even those whom you brought forth march at her side. They throng and march at the side of Tiamat. Enraged, they plot without cease night and day. They are set for combat, growling, raging. They have formed a council to prepare for the fight. Mother Huber, she who fashions all things, has added matchless weapons, has borne monster serpents, sharp of tooth, unsparing of fang, with venom for blood she has filled their bodies. Roaring dragons she has clothed with terror, has crowned them with halos making them like gods, so that he who beholds them is overcome by terror, their bodies rear up and none can withstand their attack. She has set up the viper, the dragon, and the monster Lahomu, the great lion, the mad dog, and the scorpion man, mighty lion demons, the dragonfly, the centaur. Bearing weapons that spare not, fearless in battle, her decrees are firm, none can resist them. After this fashion, eleven of this kind she has brought forth. From among the gods, her firstborn, who formed her assembly, she has elevated King Yu, has made him chief among them. The leading of the ranks, command of the assembly, the raising of weapons for the encounter advancing to combat. To direct the battle, to control the fight, these to his hands she entrusted as she seated him in the council. I have cast the spell for you, exalting you in the assembly of the gods. To counsel all the gods I have given you full power. Truly you are supreme, you are my only consort. Your utterance shall prevail over all the Anunnaki. She has given him the tablet of destinies fastened on his breast. As for you, your command shall be unchangeable, your word shall endure. As soon as King Yu was elevated, possessed of the rank of Anu, for the gods, her sons, they decreed the fate. Your word shall make the fire subside, shall humble the power weapon so potent in its sweep. I sent forth Anu, he could not face her. Nudimud was afraid and turned back. But Marduk came forth, the wisest of gods, your son, his heart having prompted him to set out to face Tiamat. He opened his mouth, saying unto me, If I indeed, as your avenger, am to vanquish Tiamat and save your lives, set up the assembly, proclaim supreme my destiny. When jointly, in Ubshukina, you have set down rejoicing, let my word instead of you determine the fates. Unalterable shall be what I may bring into being. Neither recalled nor change shall be the command of my lips. Now hasten here and promptly fix for him your decrees, that he may go forth to face your mighty foe. Gaga departed, proceeding on his way. Before Lamu and Lahamu, the gods, his fathers, he made his obscience kissing the ground at their feet. He bowed low as he took his place to address them. It was Anshar, your son, who has sent me here, charging me to give voice to the dictates of his heart. He says that Tiamat, she who bore us, detests us. She has set up the assembly and is furious with rage. All the gods have rallied to her. Even those whom you brought forth march at her side. They are banded together and march at the side of Tiamat. Enraged, they plot without cease night and day. They are set for combat, growling, raging. They have formed a council to prepare for the fight. Mother Huber, she who fashions all things, has added matchless weapons, has borne monster serpents, sharp of tooth, unsparing of fang. With venom for blood she has filled their bodies. Roaring dragons she has clothed with terror, has crowned them with halos, making them like gods, so that he who beholds them terror overcomes him. Their bodies rear up, and no one can withstand their attack. She has set up vipers, dragons, and the monster Lahamu, great lions, mad dogs, and scorpion men, mighty lion demons, dragonflies, and centaurs, bearing weapons that spare not, fearless in battle, firm are decrees, past withstanding are they. 
After this fashion, eleven of this kind she has brought forth. From among the gods, her firstborn, who formed her assembly, she has elevated King Yu, has made him chief among them, the leading of the ranks, command of the assembly, the raising of weapons for the encounter, advancing to combat, to direct the battle, to control the fight. These to his hands she has entrusted as she seated him in the council. I have cast the spell for you, exalting you in the assembly of the gods. To counsel all the gods I have given you full power. Truly you are supreme, you are my only consort. Your utterance shall prevail over all the Anunnaki. She has given him the tablet of destinies fastened on his breast. As for you, your command shall be unchangeable, your word shall endure. As soon as King Yu was elevated, possessed of the rank of Anu, for the gods her sons they decreed the fate. Your word shall make the fire subside, shall humble the power weapon so potent in its sweep. I sent forth Anu, he could not face her. Nudimud was afraid and turned back. But Marduk came forth, the wisest of gods, your son. His heart having prompted him to set out to face Tiamat, he opened his mouth, saying unto me, If I indeed, as your avenger, am to vanquish Tiamat and save your lives, set up the assembly, proclaim supreme my destiny. When in Ubshukina, jointly you sit down rejoicing, let my word instead of you determine the fates. Unalterable shall be what I may bring into being. Neither recalled nor changed shall be the command of my lips. Now hasten here and promptly fix for him your decrees, that he may go forth to face your mighty foe. When Lamu and Lahamu heard this, they cried out aloud. All the Agigi wailed in distress. How strange that they should have made this decision. We cannot fathom the doings of Tiamat. They made ready to leave on their journey all the great gods who decree the fates. They entered before Anshar, filling Ubshakina. They kissed one another in the assembly. They held converse as they sat down to the banquet. They ate bread, they mixed wine. They wetted their drinking tubes with sweet intoxicant. As they drank the strong drink, their bodies swelled. They became very languid as their spirits rose. For Marduk, their avenger, they fixed the decrees. They erected for him a princely throne. Facing his fathers, he sat down, presiding. You are the most honored of the great gods. Your decree is unrivaled. Your command is Anu. You, Marduk, are the most honored of the great gods. Your decree is unrivaled. Your word is Anu. From this day, your pronouncement shall be unchangeable. To raise or bring low, these shall be in your hand. Your utterance shall be, your command shall be unimpeachable. No one among the gods shall transgress your bounds. Adornment being wanted for the seats of the gods, let the place of their shrines ever be in your place. O Marduk, you are indeed our avenger. We have granted you kingship over the universe entire. When you sit in assembly, your word shall be supreme. Your weapons shall not fail. They shall smash your foes. O Lord, spare the life of him who trusts you. But pour out the life of the God who seized evil, having placed in their midst a garment. They address themselves to Marduk, their firstborn. May thy fate, O Lord, be supreme among the gods. Say, but to wreck or create, it shall be. Open your mouth, the garment will vanish. Speak again, and the garment will be whole. At the word of his mouth, the garment vanished. He spoke again, and the garment was restored. When the gods, his fathers, saw the fruit of his word, joyfully they did homage. Marduk is king. They conferred on him scepter, throne, and vestment. They gave him matchless weapons that ward off the foes. Go and cut off the life of Tiamat. May the winds bear her blood to places undisclosed. Bel's destiny thus fixed the gods, his fathers, caused him to go the way of success and attainment. He constructed a bow marked it as his weapon, attached thereto the arrow, fixed its bow cord. He raised the mace, made his right hand grasp it, bow and quiver he hung at his side. In front of him he set the lightning. With a blazing flame he filled his body. He then made a net to enfold Tiamat therein. The four winds he stationed that nothing of her might escape. The south wind, the north wind, the east wind, the west wind. Close to his side he held the net, the gift of his father Anu. 
He brought forth in Hulu the evil wind, the whirlwind, the hurricane, fourfold wind, the sevenfold wind, the cyclone, the matchless wind. Then he set forth the winds he had brought forth, the seven of them. To stir up the inside of Tiamat, they rose up behind him. Then the Lord raised up the flood storm, his mighty weapon. He mounted the storm chariot, irresistible and terrifying. He harnessed and yoked to it a team of four, the killer, the relentless, the trampler, the swift. Their lips were parted, their teeth bore poison. They were tireless and skilled in destruction. On his right he posted the smiter, fearsome in battle. On the left, the combat, which repels all the zealous. For a cloak he was wrapped in an armor of terror. With this fearsome halo his head was turbaned. The Lord with forth, went forth and followed his course. Towards the raging Tiamat he set his face. In his lips he held a spell. A plant to put out poison was grasped in his hand. Then they milled about him. The gods milled about him. The gods, his fathers, milled about him. The gods milled about him. The Lord approached to scan the inside of Tiamat, and of Kingu, her consort, the scheme to perceive. As he looks on, he loses his way. His will is distracted, and his doings are confused. And when the gods, his helpers, who marched at his side, saw the valiant hero, their vision became blurred. Tiamat emitted a cry without turning her neck, framing savage defiance in her lips. You are too important for the Lord of the gods to rise up against you. Is it in their place that they have gathered, or in your place? Thereupon the Lord, having raised the floodstorm, his mighty weapon, to enrage Tiamat, he sent word as follows. Why are you risen, haughtily exalted? You have charged your own heart to stir up conflict. Sons reject their own fathers, while you who have borne them have forsworn love. You have appointed King Yu as your consort, conferring upon him the rank of Anu not rightfully his. Against Anshar, king of the gods, you seek evil. Against the gods, my fathers, you have confirmed your wickedness. Though your forces are drawn up, your weapons girded on, stand up that I and you might meet in single combat. When Tiamat heard this, she was like one possessed. She took leave of her senses. In fury, Tiamat cried out aloud. To the roots, her legs shook both together. She recites a charm, keeps casting her spell, while the gods of battle sharpened their weapons. Then Tiamat and Marduk joined issue, wisest of gods. They strove in single combat, locked in battle. The Lord spread out his net to enfold her. The evil wind, which followed behind, he let loose in her face. When Tiamat opened her mouth to consume him, he drove in the evil wind while as yet she had not shut her lips. As the terrible winds filled her belly, her body was distended and her mouth was wide open. He released the arrow, it tore her belly, it cut through her insides, splitting the heart. Having thus subdued her, he extinguished her life. He cast down her carcass to stand upon it. After he had slain Tiamat, the leader, her band was shattered, her troop broken up. And the gods, her helpers who marched at her side, trembling with terror, turned their backs out in order to save and preserve their lives. Tightly encircled, they could not escape. He made them captives, and he smashed their weapons. Thrown into the net, they found themselves ensnared. Placed in cells, they were filled with wailing. Bearing his wrath, they were held in prison. And the eleven creatures which she had charged with all, the whole band of demons that marched on her right, he cast into fetters, their hands he bound. For all their resistance he trampled them underfoot, and King Yu, who had been made chief among them, he bound and accounted him to a gay. He took from him the tablet of destinies, not rightfully his, sealed them with a seal and fastened them on his breast. When he had vanquished and subdued his adversaries, had the vainglorious foe had wholly established Anshar's triumph, over the foe, had achieved Nudimud's desire, valiant Marduk strengthened his hold on the vanquished gods, and turned back to Tiamat whom he had bound. The Lord trod on the legs of Tiamat, with his unsparing mace he crushed her skull. 
When the arteries of her blood he had severed, the north wind bore it to places undisclosed. On seeing this, his fathers were joyful and jubilant. They brought gifts of homage to him. Then the Lord paused to view her dead body, that he might divide the form and do artful works. He split her like a shellfish into two parts. Half of her he set up as a covering for heaven, pulled down the bar and posted guards. He bade them to allow not her waters to escape. He crossed the heavens and surveyed the regions. He squared Apsu's quarter, the abode of Nudimud, as the Lord measured the dimensions of Apsu. The great abode, its likeness, he fixed as Eshara. The great abode Eshara, which he made as the firmament, Anu, Enlil, and Ea, he made occupy their places. He constructed stations for the great gods, fixing their astral likenesses as the stars of the zodiac. He determined the year and into sections he divided it. He set up three constellations for each of the twelve months. After defining the days of the year by means of heavenly figures, he founded the station of the pole star, Nibiru, to determine their bounds, that no one might err to go astray. Alongside it, he set up the stations of Enlil and Ea. Having opened the gates on both sides, he strengthened the locks to the left and the right. In her belly, he established the zenith. The moon he caused to shine, entrusting the night to him. He appointed him a creature of the night to signify the days, and marked off every month without cease by means of his crown. At the month's very start, rising over the land, you shall have luminous horns to signify six days. On the seventh day, reaching a half crown, so shall the fifteen-day period be like one another, two halves for each month. When the sun overtakes you at the base of heaven, diminish your crown and retrogress in light. At the time of disappearance, approach the course of the sun. And on the thirtieth, you shall again stand in opposition to the sun. I have appointed a sign, follow its path, approach and give judgment. Lines 25 through 44 are badly damaged and untranslatable. Apparently after Marduk created the moon, he then created the sun, Shamash. After he had appointed the days to Shamash, and had established the precincts of night and day, taking the spittle of Tiamat, Marduk created, he formed the clouds and filled them with water. The raising of winds, the bringing of rain and cold, making the midst smoke piling up, these he planned himself, took into his own hand. Putting her head into position, he formed there on the mountains, opening the deep which was in flood. He caused to flow from her eyes the Euphrates and Tigris. Stopping her nostrils he left, he formed from her breasts the lofty mountains. Therein he drilled springs for wells to carry off the water. Twisting her tail he bound it to Derma, Apsu at his foot. Her crotch she was fastened to the heavens. Thus he covered the heavens and established the earth. In the midst of Tiamat he made flow, his net he completely let out. So he created heaven and earth, their bounds established. When he had designed his rules and fashioned his ordinances, he founded the shrines and handed them over to Ea. The tablet of destinies which he had taken from King Yu, he carried. He brought it at the first gift of greeting, he gave it to Anu. The gods who had done battle and been scattered, he led bound into the presence of his fathers. Now the eleven creatures which Tiamat had made, whose weapons he had shattered, which he had tied to his foot, of these he made statues and set them up at the gate of Apsu, saying, Let it be a token that this may never be forgotten. When the gods saw this, they were exceedingly glad. Lamu and Lahamu and all his fathers crossed over to him, and Anshar the king made manifest his greeting. Anu, Enlil, and Ea presented to him gifts. With a gift, Damkina, his mother, made him joyous. She sent offerings, his face brightened. To Usmi, who brought her gift to a secret place, he entrusted the chancellorship of Apsu and the stewardship of the shrines. Being assembled, all the Agigi bowed down, while every one of the Anunnaki kissed his feet. Their assembly to do obeisance, they stood before him, bowed, and said, He is the king. After the gods, his fathers were satiated with his charms. Lines 90 through 106 are too badly damaged for translation. Apparently, it describes Marduk on his throne with his weapons. 
Ea and Damkina, they opened their mouths to speak to the great gods, the Agigi. Formerly, Marduk was merely our beloved son. Now he is your king. Proclaim his title. A second speech they made, they all spoke. His name shall be Lugald Imer Akina. Trust in him. When they had given the sovereignty to Marduk, they declared for him a formula of good fortune and success. Henceforth, you will be the patron of our sanctuaries. Whatever your command, we will do. Marduk opened his mouth to speak, to say a word to the gods, his fathers. Above the Apsu, where you have resided, the counterpart of Ashara, which I have built over you. Below, I have hardened the ground for a building site. I will build a house. It will be my luxurious abode. I will found therein its temple. I will appoint its inner rooms. I will establish my sovereignty. When you come up from the Apsu for assembly, you will spend the night in it. It is there to receive all of you. When you descend from heaven for assembly, you will spend the night in it. It is there to receive all of you. I will call its name Babylon, which means the houses of great gods. I shall build it with the skill of craftsmen. When the gods, his fathers, heard this speech of his, they put the following question to Marduk, their firstborn. Over all that your hands have created, who will have your authority? Over the ground which your hands have created, who will have your power? Babylon, which you have given a fine name, therein establish our abode forever. Let them bring our daily ration, our... Let no one usurp our task which we previously performed, therein its labor. Marduk rejoiced when he heard this, and he answered those gods who had questioned him. He that slew Tiamat showed them light. He opened his mouth, his speech was noble. Them will be entrusted to you. The gods bowed down before him, they spoke to him, they said to Lugal, Emer, Ankia, Formerly the Lord was merely our beloved son, now he is our king, proclaim his title. He whose pure incantation gave us life, he is the Lord of splendor, mace, and scepter. Ea, who knows the skill of all crafts, let him prepare the plans. We will be the workers. When Marduk heard the words of the gods, his heart prompted him to fashion artful works. Opening his mouth, he addressed Ea to impart the plan he had conceived in his heart. I will take blood and fashion bone. I will establish a savage. Man shall be his name. Truly, savage man I will create. He shall be charged with the service of the gods, that they might be at ease. The ways of the gods I will artfully alter. Though alike revered into two groups, they shall be divided. Ea answered him, speaking a word to him, giving him another plan for the relief of the gods. Let but one of their brothers be handed over. He alone shall perish that mankind may be fashioned. Let the great gods be here in assembly. Let the guilty be handed over that they may endure. Marduk summoned the great gods to assembly. Presiding graciously, he issued instructions. To his utterance, the gods pay heed. The king addressed a word to the Anunnaki. If your former statement was true, now declare the truth on oath by me. Who was it that contrived the uprising, and made Tiamat rebel, and joined battle? Let him be handed over who contrived the uprising, his guilt I will make him bear. You shall dwell in peace. The Igigi, the great gods, replied to him. To Lugald Emer Akia, counselor of the gods, their lord, it was King Yu who contrived the uprising, and made Tiamat rebel, and joined battle. They bound him, holding him before Ea. They imposed on him his punishment and severed his blood vessels. Out of his blood they fashioned mankind. He imposed on him the service and let free the gods. After Ea, the wise, had created mankind, had imposed upon them the service of the gods, that work was beyond comprehension. As artfully planned by Marduk, did Nudimud create it. Marduk, the king of the gods, divided all the great gods, Anunnaki, above and below. He assigned them to Anu to guard his instructions. Three hundred in the heavens he stationed as a guard. In like manner the ways of the earth he defined. In heaven and on earth six hundred thus he settled. After he had ordered all the instructions, to the Anunnaki of heaven and earth had allotted their portions, and said to Marduk their lord, Now, O lord, you who have caused our deliverance, what shall be our homage to you? 
Let us build a shrine whose name shall be called, Lo, a chamber for our nightly rest. Let us repose in it. Let us build a throne, a recess for his abode. On the day that we arrive, we shall repose in it. When Marduk heard this, brightly glowed his features, like the day. Construct Babylon, whose building you have requested. Let its brickwork be fashioned. You shall name it the sanctuary. The Anunnaki applied the implement. For one whole year they molded bricks. When the second year arrived, they raised high the head of Esagila, equaling Apsu. Having built a stage tower as high as Apsu, they set up in an abode for Marduk, Enlil, and Ea. In their presence, he was seated in grandeur. To the base of Eshara, its horns looked down. After they had achieved the building of Esagila, all the Anunnaki erected their shrines. The 300 Agigi, all of them gathered. The Lord, being on the lofty dais which they had built as his abode. The gods, his fathers, at his banquet he seated. This is Babylon, the place that is your home. Make Mary in its precincts occupy its broad places. The great gods took their seats. They set up festive drink, set down to a banquet. After they had made Mary within it, in Esagila the splendid had performed their rites. The norms had been fixed in all their portents. All the gods apportioned the stations of heaven and earth. The fifty great gods took their seats. The seven gods of destiny set up the three hundred in heaven. Enlil raised the bow, his weapon, and laid it before them. The gods, his fathers, saw the net he had made. When they beheld the bow, how skillful its shape, his fathers praised the work he had wrought. Raising it, Anu spoke up in the assembly of the gods, and he kissed the bow. This is my daughter. He named the names of the bow as follows. Longwood is the first. The second is accurate. Its third name is Bostar. In heaven I have made it shine. He fixed its position with the gods its brothers. After Anu had decreed the fate of the bow and had placed the lofty royal throne before the gods, Anu placed it in the assembly of the gods. When the great gods had assembled, they extolled the destiny of Marduk. They bowed down. They pronounced among themselves a curse, swearing by water and oil to place life in jeopardy. Anshar pronounced supreme his name, Asharluhai, saying, Let us do obeisance at the mention of his name. To his utterance let the gods give heed. Let his command be supreme above and below. Most exalted be the sun, our avenger. Let his sovereignty be surpassing, having no rival. May he shepherd the black-headed ones, his creatures. To the end of days, without forgetting, let them acclaim his ways. May he establish for his fathers the great food offerings. Their support they shall furnish, shall tend their sanctuaries. May he cause incense to be smelled, their spells. Make a likeness on earth of what he has wrought in heaven. May he order the black-headed to revere him. May the subjects ever bear in mind to speak of their God. And may they at his word pay heed to the goddess. May food offerings be borne for their gods and goddesses. Without fail, let them support their gods. Their lands let them improve. Build their shrines. Let the black-headed wait on their gods. As for us, by however many names we pronounce, he is our God. Let us then proclaim his fifty names. He whose ways are glorious, whose deeds are likewise, Marduk, as Anu his father, called him from his birth who provides gazing and drinking places and riches their stalls, who with the food storm his weapon vanquished the detractors, and who the gods his fathers rescued from distress. Truly the son of the sun, most radiant of gods, is he. In his brilliant light may they walk forever, on the people he brought forth endowed with life. The service of the gods he imposed that these may have ease, creation, destruction, deliverance, grace shall be by his command, they shall look up to him. Maruka truly is the God, creator of all, who gladdens the heart of the Anunnaki, appeases the Igigi. Marutuku truly is the refuge of his land, city, and people. Unto him shall the people give praise forever. Barashha Kushu stood up and took hold of its reins. Wide in his heart, warm his sympathy. Lugald Imarakia is his name, which we proclaimed in our assembly. His commands we have exalted above the gods, his fathers. 
Truly he is Lord of all the gods of heaven and underworld, the king at whose discipline the gods above and below are in mourning. Nari Lugald Imarachia is the name of him, whom we have called the monitor of the gods, who in heaven and on earth founds for us retreats in trouble, and who allots stations to the Igigi and Anunnaki. At his name the gods shall tremble and quake in retreat. Asarul Udu is that the name of his, which Anu his father proclaimed for him. He is truly the light of the gods, the mighty leader, who, as the protecting deities of God and land, in fierce single battle saved our retreats in distress. Asarul Udu, secondly, they have named Nam Tiluku, the god who maintains life, who restored the lost gods as though his own creation the Lord who revives the dead gods by his pure incantation, who destroys the wayward foes, let us praise his prowess. Asarul Udu, whose name was thirdly called Namru, the shining god who illumines our ways. There each of his names have Anshar, Lamu, and Lahamu proclaimed, unto the gods their sons they did utter them. We have proclaimed three each of his names. Like us do you utter his names. Joyfully the gods heeded their command. As in Ubshukina they exchanged counsels. Of the heroic son our avenger, of our supporter we will exalt the name. They sat down in their assembly to fashion destinies, all of them uttering his names in the sanctuary. Asaru, Marduk, bestower of cultivation, who established water levels, creator of grain and herbs, who causes vegetation to sprout, Asarulim, who is honored in the place of counsel, who excels in counsel, to whom the gods hope, not being possessed of fear, Asarulim Nuna, the gracious light of the father, his begetter, who directs the decrees of Anu, Enlil, Ia, and Nainigiku, he is their provider who assigns their portions, whose horn cap is plenty, multiplying. Tutu is he, who created then anew. Let him purify their shrines that they may have ease. Let him devise the spell that the gods may be at rest. Should they rise in anger, let them turn back. Truly he is supreme in the assembly of the gods. No one among the gods is his equal. Tutu is Zukkena, life of the host of the gods, who established for the gods the holy heavens who keeps a hold on their ways, determines their courses, he shall not be forgotten by the beclouded. Let them remember his deeds. Tutu they thirdly called Zaiku, who brings purification, God of the favoring breeze, the Lord of hearing and mercy, who produces riches and treasures, establishes abundance, who has turned all our wants to plenty, whose favoring breeze we felt in sore distress, let them speak, let them exalt, let them sing his praises. Tutu, fourthly, let the people magnify as Agaku, the lord of the holy charm, who revives the dead, who had mercy on the vanquished gods, who removed the yoke imposed on the gods, his enemies, and who, to redeem them, created mankind, the merciful, in whose power it lies to grant life. May his deeds endure, not to be forgotten. In the mouth of the black-headed whom his hands have created, Tutu, fifthly, is Tuku, whose holy spell their mouths shall murmur, who with his holy charm has uprooted all the evil ones, Shazu, who knows the heart of the gods, who examines the inside, from whom the evildoer cannot escape, who sets up the assembly of the gods, gladdens their hearts, who subdues the insubmissive, their widespread protection, who directs justice, roots out crooked talk, who wrong and right in place keeps apart, Jazu, may they secondly exalt as Sisi, who silences the insurgent, who banishes consternation from the body of the gods his fathers. Jazu is thirdly Shirim, who with the weapon roots out all enemies, who frustrates their plans, scatters them to the winds, who blots out all the wicked ones who tremble before him. Let the gods exult in assembly, Jazu is fourthly Shugarim, who ensures a hearing for the gods his fathers, creator of the gods his fathers, who roots out the enemies, destroys their progeny, who frustrates their doings, leaving nothing of them. 
May his name be invoked and spoken in the land. Jazu, fifthly, they shall praise as Zarim, the Lord of the living, who destroys all adversaries, all the disobedient, pursues the evil, who all the fugitive gods brought home to their shrines. May this his name endure. To Jazu, moreover, they shall, sixthly, render all honor as Zagarim, who all the foes destroyed as though in battle. In Bilulu, the Lord who makes them flourish is he, the mighty one who named them, who instituted roast offerings, who ever regulates for the land the grazing and watering places, who opened the wells, apportioning waters of abundance. In Bilulu, secondly, they shall glorify as Epidun, the Lord who sprinkles the field, irrigator of heaven and earth who establishes seed rows, who forms fine plow land in the steppe. Dam and ditch regulates who delimits the furrow. Inbi Lulu, thirdly, they shall praise as Inbi Lulu Gugal, the irrigator of the plantations of the gods, lord of abundance, opulence, and of ample crops, who provides wealth, enriches all dwellings, who furnishes millet, causes barley to appear. Inbi Lulu is Higal. Higal who heaps up abundance for the people's consumption, who causes rich rains over the wide earth, provides vegetation, Surser, who heaped up a mountain over her, Tiamat, who the corpse of Tiamat carried off with his weapon, who directs the land, their faithful shepherd, whose hair is a grain field, his horn cap furrows, who the wide spreading sea vaults in his wrath, crossing her like a bridge at the place of single combat. Surser, secondly, they named Mala, and so forth. Tiamat in his vessel, and he the rider. Gil, who stores up grain heaps, massive mounds, who brings forth barley and millet, furnishes the seed of the land. Gilma, who makes lasting the lofty abode of the gods, creator of security. The hoop that holds the barrel together, who presents good things. A Gilma, the exalted one, who tears off the crown from the wrong position, who creates the clouds above the waters, makes enduring aloft. Zulum, who designates the fields for the gods, allots the creation, who grants portions and food offerings, tends the shrines. Mamu, creator of heaven and earth, who directs the god who sanctifies heaven and earth, is secondly Zulumar. Gishnam Unab, creator of all people, who made the world regions, destroyer of the gods of Tiamat, who made men out of their substance. Lugal Abduber, the king who frustrated the work of Tiamat, rooted out her weapons, whose foundation is firm in front and in the rear. Pagal Gaina, foremost of all the lords whose strength is outstanding, who is preeminent in the royal abode, most exalted of the gods. Lugald Irma, the king of the band of the gods, lord of rulers, who is preeminent in the abode of the gods, most exalted of the gods. Aranuna, counselor of Ea, creator of the gods, his fathers, whose princely ways no god whatever can equal. Dumuduku, whose pure dwelling is renewed in Duku. Dumuduku, without whom Lugal Kuduga makes no decision. Lugalana, the king whose strength is outstanding among the gods, the lord, strength of Anu, who became supreme at the call of Anshar. Lugal Uga, who carried off all them amidst the struggle, who all wisdom encompasses, broad in perception. Urkingu, who carried off Kingu in the thick of battle, who conveys guidance for all, establishes rulership. Kinma, who directs all the gods, giver of counsel, at whose name the gods quake in fear, as at the storm. Ezekur shall sit aloft in the house of prayer. May the gods bring their presence before him, that from him they may receive their assignments. None can without him create artful works. Four black-headed ones are among his creatures. Aside from him, no god knows the answer as to their days. Gibble, who maintains the sharp point of the weapon, who creates artful works in the battle with Tiamat, who has broad wisdom, is accomplished in insight, whose mind is so vast that the gods, all of them, cannot fathom it. Adu, 
be his name, the whole sky may he cover. May his beneficent roar ever hover over the earth. May he, as Mamu, diminish the clouds. Below, may he furnish substance for the people. Asharu, who, as is, is his name, guided the gods of destiny. All of the people are truly in his charge. Nibiru shall hold the crossings of heaven and earth. So that the gods cannot cross above and below, they must wait upon him. Nibiru is the star, which in the skies is brilliant. May he hold the beginning and the future. May they pay homage unto him, saying, He who forced his way through the midst of Tiamat without resting, let Nibiru be his name, who controls its midst. May they uphold the course of the stars of heaven. May he shepherd all the gods like sheep. May he vanquish Tiamat. May her life be straight and short. Into the future of mankind, when days have grown old, may she recede without cease and stay away forever. Because he created the spaces and fashioned the firm ground. Father Enlil called his name Lord of the Lands. When all the names which the Igigi proclaimed, Ea had heard, his spirit rejoiced. Thus, he whose names his fathers have glorified, he is indeed even as I, his name shall be Ea. All my combined rights he shall administer, all my instructions he shall carry out. With the title Fifty, the great gods proclaimed him whose names are Fifty, and made his way supreme. Let them be kept in mind, and let the leader explain them. Let the wise and the knowing discuss them together. Let the father recite them and impart to his son. Let the ears of shepherd and herdsman be opened. Let him rejoice in Marduk, the Enlil of the gods, that his land may be fertile and that he may prosper. Firm in his order, his command unalterable, the utterance of his mouth no god shall change. When he looks, he does not turn away his neck. When he is angry, no god can withstand his wrath. His heart is unfathomable. His purpose is broad. Sinner and transgressor may come before him. He wrote down and thereby preserved it for the future. The dwelling of Marduk, which the gods, the Agigi, had made. Let them speak. The song of Marduk, who vanquished Tiamat and achieved the kingship.